Yo, yo, yo. Microphone check, microphone check. Can you hear me? All right, all right. Today, unfortunately for you, is going to be another day that you will not get a chance to see my handsome face. Um, we are going to be discussing the ancestors. And what you can do to get them to help you. But, you know, of course, we'll have to show you a few things before you believe it right off the bat. Sure, right? Because, I mean, right now we're, we're, at a, we're at a great time in history, in the universe, in the history of the universe, right? At least from my perspective, I've only been here 54 years as a couple of weeks ago. But from my observation, I see more black people embracing their African culture. To put that in quotes. I see more uh, black people. mentioning their ancestors and in conversation and lots of memes everywhere about our ancestors and what the ancestors would do and all this kind of stuff so it seems it appears to me to be uh, a new addition to uh, our culture that, that that I would say which which comes from the racist white supremacists okay because most of us have developed you know I mean what what they call or what they claim is black culture today really is um, controlled and, de and determined by uh, the racist white supremacists in, in, in a lot of ways um and you know the, the whole mindset that we have you know going back a few generations you know great uh, at least at least to your great great grandparents if you're my age there's a mindset that um, we're Americans we're black and American or African American. Those should all be in quotes. Those those terms. But uh, it it appears to me that uh, well you know uh, foundational Black American or American descendant of slavery, whatever whatever you want to fit into. If you are a Black person here in the so-called United States that uh, has descendants who were enslaved here in the so-called United States, you is, is who I'm talking to. When I say uh, this black culture that we've, that we, that we, a, a lot of us practice here, right? It used to be years ago, it used to be, uh, you know, Christianity, was a part of that culture um, crime I, you know it used to be a time when uh, there was I mean the promotion of crime or certain crimes or having a certain type of there being a certain type of behavior that some people uh, attribute to being black culture there, I remember a time when that's that's what we'd see and hear of most of the time, right? Um, but now there's like enough 
there, there's there's huge numbers of black people who are uh, talking against it, you know, talking against crime. Uh, they're talking against Christianity or just giving it up and saying this is not something they want to be or they want to be a part of. But there was a, a you know, a, a very long history of uh, black people uh, being connected to black people here in the United States being connected to uh, Christianity. And that was something that the slave master heavily ingrained uh, in the minds of our people to the to the point that it became a part of our culture right it's like huge numbers of black people who believe that you know being a christian is what we've always been right um and i'm i'm saying this to say that some of the circumstances that have led me to talk about the subject of the ancestors today is because it seems to me that it's a crucial part that we are lacking in right as far as like there's there it appears to me to to have been a huge effort on the part of the white supremacists to keep us away from venerating our ancestors and so i want to show you how our victimization right one of the 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 thing that i liked about the united independent Story code system concept is how it uh it can give you a breakdown of, of things. And so when I see the system of racism, white supremacy, I, I see that system is being made up into or broken up into nine parts, right? Economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. These are all areas of people activity which the racist white supremacists know way 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 much more than we do in these areas even though the knowledge the basic knowledge for all nine major areas originated with our ancestors in Kemet when the uh, racist white supremacists intervene and kidnap our ancestors in the process of making sure that they remain submissive and uh, you know uh, remain dominated and subjugated was for them to remove that knowledge from our people, from our ancestors. So those of us who are here in the United States specifically who have descendants of slaves, who are descendants of slaves here in the United States in particular, we have uh, been completely brain trashed, right? The, the slave masters here, they learn from the mistakes of the others. Let me let me put it to you. Do you all know that the whole that the Haitian Revolution, what, what started the ha Haitian Revolution, or let me say the the spark to the Haitian Revolution was the sacrifice of a goat? Did you know that? And th this is one of the things why I think, one of the reasons why I think um, they've tried to keep us heavily saturated with Christianity because in Christianity, there's certain things or in the, Christ the version of Christianity that they've taught us, there's certain symbols and colors and animals 
that uh, they have taught us to be afraid of, right? They want you to think when they when, when you think of of, of a goat, uh, they want you to think about uh, you know this when you think about the killing of a goat, uh, they want you to think about voodoo or uh, what what the devil. There's a demon that, that looks like a goat. It's got the head of a goat or something. You you know the colors of the devil or the colors of hell are red and black, which are the colors of uh, Eshu Alegua, who is the uh, the main energy that introduces you to uh, the rest of them, right? It, it's just, uh, and and then all of the things that they've done to make us afraid of the dead, right? Everything that they've constantly made us afraid of were dead things. Uh, uh, what uh, uh, mummies? You know, mummy is 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 uh, mummy was actually the first one. I'm sure that they were uh, pushing fear with, right? Because of course, where does the mummy come from? The mummy comes from Kemet, which is where the knowledge began, right? Anyway, uh, then you got the vampire, right? The vampire is supposed to be from the dead uh frankenstein is supposed to be from the dead um uh everything let's see what other you know halloween in the beginning when that had when that was i guess when it was first coming out everything had to do with the dead you know well you still see stuff that has to do with the dead around halloween they break out with the tombstones people put little tombstones in their yards and then uh, they want you to be afraid of ghosts and uh, uh, what else do they they tell us come from uh, skeletons. You know, skeletons are, are the represent the dead. You have all these different uh, symbols or images of the dead that they presented us with. You know, just the skull. Uh, you know they they associate they tell you satanism is associated with with the dead they got all these things that uh they've been heavily pushing on your brain on your psyche in in the brain trashing process of keeping you away from the dead even in the word the the, the words R.I.P. Rest in peace. Right? They want you to let the dead rest in peace. I mean, don't bother the dead, right? Why? Because if you bother the dead, spooky, scary things are going to happen to you. Dangerous and deadly. Negative things are going to happen to you if you mess around with the dead. Right? So let the dead rest in peace. This is what they always tell you, right? But yet and still, they want to, they tell you that there's going to be a day that will come when the dead would be resurrected. But who do they want you to leave the resurrecting of the dead up to? A blonde haired, blue eyed white man. They want you to wait until this blonde haired blue eyed white man who hasn't showed up in 2000 years. They want you to wait for him to show up and resurrect your dead. When you have the power to resurrect your dead yourself. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? This is the setup. This is the setup. They gave us it, it, uh, worshiping the dead or venerating the dead. I would say venerating the dead is something that is ancient. When you think about Kemet and the pyramids, everybody says, well, we don't know what the, what the mystery of the pyramids is. Yeah, you do. The pyramids were built to the, to the dead. They were tombs. The pyramids were tombs that the people of Kemet 
Kemet dedicated towards their ancestors. This is what they did. And the people of Kemet taught that knowledge, which I'd say today will come in the area of religion. They taught all of that knowledge, that, you know, of the nine major areas, but in specific, a specific area, this religious area, this uh, area that has to do with uh, the spirit, has to do with your spirit, that energy force that is within your body right now. If, if you've ever seen someone who's dead, you'll know what I'm talking about. Because when you see a dead person, that life force is gone. That energy is gone. It's gone from their body. Their body is like a rag doll. It's when that force is gone. In... Uh, traditional the traditional african belief system that i practice that energy force that that uh that that lives that stays within your body uh that some people tend to call the soul we call it ori so i'm going to refer to it as ori okay well Because Ori is an energy, it never dies. Okay? The forces of energy, energy never dies. It just moves on. And so, oh, hold on. Okay, so I'm back. So basically, I think that it is extremely constructive for you to establish a connection with your ancestors and when i say ancestors i mean your direct ancestors those who you share dna with the 
those ancestors can help you. You have to get it out of your head that what I'm talking to you about will not work. You've got to try it. If there's anything that I believe deep down in my heart that the racist white supremacists want you to stay away from is ancestral veneration and what it can do for you. I was checking out this uh, this series that comes on, uh, well, it's over with now, but it was on Amazon Prime. It's called Them. I wonder if I'm allowed to show you the trailer. I don't even want to take a chance and show you the trailer, but if you can, look it up real quick. It's a movie called Them, T-H-E-M. Essentially, it's about a, uh, it's it's like in the 1950s, I believe. And it represents that time in history, one of the times in history when uh, black people, and many of these people are your ancestors now, who migrated um, from the South to uh, the West. They came out to California. Uh, for opportunity because uh, there was a lot of opportunity, you know, being uh, presented to them to, you know, being told that there was opportunity, mainly, I believe, uh, during World War II uh, shipyards. They had a lot of shipyards. Most of the white people, well, most of the white men were out uh, in the war. They had been drafted and they were overseas fighting and that, uh, made uh, a way uh, because they, they needed people working that made a way for uh, black people to uh, come out to California and get jobs working in the shipyards and build help build the uh, the ships for the war and that that could be a whole another live stream uh, but basically in this movie uh, they uh, they come from the South. They come from North Carolina to California uh, to Compton, right? Now, m many of you don't know. There's lots of you who you know believe that you know where you're where you the area that you're staying in right now um, is you know was always black, right? If you if you stay in an area where everybody in uh, the area is uh, black or mostly black and you stay in uh, some western place you know some western uh, or or even uh, northern uh, state I mean of course going all the way back there's some some big cities that uh, had sections where uh, well no no because because the slaves, the majority of the slaves came to the South, right? Um, and and then slavery was abolished in in uh, other places like the West and in uh, northern states, which is why the uh, you know, the slaves started uh, running. So I guess uh, there were some migrations happening during slavery, but uh, specifically after slavery. Uh, there were there were two that were uh, great because you had uh, black people who were just basically uh, fed up with what was, what was happening in the south and uh, hearing that there might be opportunity up in the north and in the west uh, they they went and so this group this family was a, a husband a wife uh, you know and they and they uh, they had three offspring. 
attempted husband, attempted wife. They had three offspring. And the uh, basically, I don't want to you know give away the story, uh, but basically, uh, some white people uh, terrorized the family while they were in the South, and they they uh, they left the South, heading to California, you know, to California to get a new start. And where they went was Compton, California. They went to Compton. OK, and in the when Compton was first built, it was all white, just like most of the sections all over this country, the suburbs or what have you. They were built for white people. And, you know, as soon as black people started moving in, the white people started moving out. They, you know, went somewhere else. Um, but and, and this same thing happened to me. I'm, I'm going to tell you real quick. So, I mean, I'll tell you soon. But in the movie, basically they move, move to this neighborhood this white neighborhood white people are terrorizing them the white people in the area they don't want them there and they start to become haunted the family the black people start to be, they start to become haunted they get they get haunted by uh some spirits they're being haunted by some spirits throughout the house right they're basically the spirits of white people they're getting haunted by racist white people the spirits of racist white people haunt them in this uh in this movie in this movie this it's a series actually and it got me to thinking right it made me first off it made me think about the time when i'm gonna say it was in the, it was in the 80s mid mid 80s maybe around 1988 or whatever and i was i was uh y'all y'all really gonna get scared now in a few minutes when i tell you i was playing with the ouija board did i lose you did i lose anybody who ran Okay, so I was playing with a Ouija board. And, you know, back then, you know, everybody was like, oh, my God, don't play with Ouija boards. Ouija boards are the devil. All this kind of stuff, right? But uh, they sold these. They sold these in uh, in the store made by Parker Brothers. You could buy, you could go to uh, Toys R Us or uh, K uh, Kmart. I don't even know if they got a Kmart anymore, but Kmart, um, which is the predecessor to Walmart and Target and, you know, uh, Fred Meyer and all them kind of stores or whatever. Um, you could go up there in the toy suit to toy section where they had the games and it was listed as a, it, it's not listed, but it's, it's in the game section. You could buy it in the game section. I don't see them anymore, but I bought a Ouija board. And so, um anyway this made me flash back to a time with with this the house that i grew up in and all the little different little funny style things that used to happen to me right but i was playing the ouija board with this white girl she, she sat down we played the ouija board we were playing the ouija board one day and a, a, a spirit, a, a white person, I remember it, raised, it, it made the hair raise up on the back of my neck, right? But we, we established communication with a white person who said that my house was built on his farm that it was his it was his farm okay that was there and how it happened was when when it was communicating we were asking it these questions and stuff right and what happened was in the middle of the questioning like when i okay so 
when I would ask a question, it would not respond to me. But when she asked the question, it would respond to her. Okay. And so um, I wanted to know why wouldn't it respond to me? And it said something to her like, he's one of he's like he's he's one of them or he's i can't remember exactly what it was but it was something that was like um that showed that 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 spirit didn't like me right and so you know from the questions that she kept asking it revealed this now mind you I have to caution because because this is something I believe for a, a very long time. And I'm, I'm just now realizing that the, you know, the other person in the room with me at this Ouija board was a white person. Right. So, you know, racist suspect could, you know, it, it, this this all could have been some deception on her part, but I don't know. I'm just saying what came to my mind. And I, I just realized that, you know, from communication with this spirit or what have you, that, you know, all of the times, the little nightmares and stuff that I had, maybe that this was the source of it, right? Because I, I there was a, a, a lot of times when these little nightmares would come, just before they would come, before they would start, I always know when they'd start because I'd hear this term, this this word shout out, Zed. I used to think it was Zed, Zed, but I realize now what it was saying was leave, leave. That's what it was saying, right? And um, all the while, this this you know, I'm watching. Like I said, I'm watching this movie, them and. It kind of just made me think about, you know, flashback to that time. And I'm thinking, what if there are? What if there's like a whole bunch of racist spirits, right? Ancestors who are the, they're the ancestors of the racist white supremacists. And they are, what if they're launching like psychic attacks? against victims of white supremacy what if we needed to call upon our ancestors to fight them to defend to, and, and have them defend us it's just a thought because when i was watching this movie right um these these entities there was one entity you know what i'm just gonna tell you damn it because most of y'all ain't gonna watch it probably um because they set it up like it's a horror and y'all get all spooky and, and, and stuff when it comes to black people stuff but you you won't have no problem going to go watch scream and nightmare on elm street and jason and all that shit but anyway the whole time she was you know it it's like all the while they kept these these uh racist white spirits right these racist spirits that were uh haunting them were capitalizing off their fear right the fear and the trauma that the white people who were breathing was causing them It's, it's like the fear and the trauma that the white people who were breathing caused them. The, the, the spirits fed off of these, these, these racist spirits fed off the, the trauma that, uh, the, the black people, uh, were, were, you know, the trauma, which was a result of the, uh, things that uh white people were doing to them in the movie okay or should i say racist suspects were doing to them in the movie right so these victims of racism all the while these racist suspects would would give them hell right um like uh you know what what caused them to flee north carolina was 
um, some white people, some some racist suspects uh, went into the uh, the house of the victim, the female victim, while the uh, while the others were gone. Right. So it was it's, it was a, a male attempted husband, a female, you know, attempt, attempted wife. And they had three offspring, two female offspring, one male offspring. Right. Little, the, the male offspring was a little baby. OK. And uh, the uh, racist suspects in the area had been watching her. They'd been watching them. And they were waiting for the opportunity to that the, for the day to come when the uh, black male would be gone, right? It was a particular day or whatever. So he was gone, and he took the uh, the his his uh, off female offspring with him. They went to the movies, and uh, these racist suspects uh, invaded the house. They raped the uh, the the black female. And they killed the baby boy, right? And and left. And so the uh, when the you know the rest of the family came back, they had been suspicious. They kind of they were kind of suspicious of the black female. In a way, they were thinking that it could be possible that she did it, because you know. They, there was no other, other, you know, there was not really any evidence or whatever, like, like the, you know, they couldn't find out or figure out who, where the white people were, or who they were, or whatever. So they kind of suspected a little bit that maybe the attempted mother had um, killed the, the boy, right? They never said anything. Nobody ever said anything openly about it, you know? But anyway, they moved to this new house. They, they, they leave North Carolina because. There's nothing they could do about it. The, the, you know, the the law enforcement's not trying to get involved or anything. And, you know, classic of of what huge numbers of our people have gone through in the South. You know, and they come to California thinking it's going to be better. And then, uh, you know, the, the racist suspects in the new neighborhood, they, they're the first victims. They're the first non-white people to move into that uh part of compton and you know all the racist suspects are giving them hell they burning you know nigger in, in the grass and calling them niggers and and you know you know the, the usual typical shit that uh they they would do in those in those days to uh our you know who are to our ancestors now most of these people are our, our ancestors now but anyway um the it, eventually they started getting stronger the the victims got to the point to where they just didn't give a damn no more you know like like a lot of victims you know when you get to that point where you sick and tired of being sick and tired you know they just got sick and tired of being sick and tired of of, of being mistreated and decided to do something about it. And in their process of deciding that, they realized they needed to get the hell out of that house. They needed to leave that house, okay? And so, in the, in the while, while they were going back and forth with these spirits, and all this stuff that was happening to them, they um, what am I trying to say? Well, they was going back and forth with the spirits. In like I said, in this process, they you know they they started developing a strength where they started fighting back, right? And when I was watching that, it started making me think. I was like, you know, if all that was going on and they had their ancestors. What would that look like? That if if their ancestors were there, they wouldn't be going through that because their ancestors would be fighting for them. You know, 
just just imagine that if you 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 think you're having a it starts off as a nightmare you see this this uh you know this uh, racist uh, white person or racist suspect uh trying to uh i can't say racist white person uh that's incorrect a racist suspect who is uh taking you you know trying to hang you from a tree or something you know and you in your in your nightmare your nightmare turns into a dream because your ancestors come riding up deep you know what i'm saying your ans your ancestors come riding up deep you know and then end up flipping the script and be like oh no 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 this ain't gonna happen right and why would they come deep they, they would come deep because you're not letting them rest in peace you're you're knowing about your ancestors you're learning about your ancestors you're learning about uh you know like um i have a great grandfather wait great grand i have a great grandfather who fought in world war one and then i have uh two grandfathers you know attempted blah blah right you know what i'm saying but they they fought in wars they were soldiers one was a uh, a buffalo soldier at west point the other one was a, a soldier in the uh in the marine corps during world war ii but you know and then there's my attempted father who was a soldier in vietnam so i'm saying these are these are spirits that are warriors, right? And when you learn the history of your ancestor, you'll, you'll find the warriors in your family too, right? I was just looking at, I, so I, was, I was looking at today, uh, like um, earlier today, I was looking at the connection. So there is a, the, the slave masters who owned uh, the slave, the slave masters by the last main, last name of Doggett, who owned uh, my ancestors, who have the last name Doggett, right? I found an article where uh, one of the slave owners by the name of Dickie Doggett was 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 killed. He, one of the slaves smashed him in the back. She she hit. It was a female slave. She hit him in the back of the head with a a brick or something and, and, and killed them right so th that was a warrior that was a warrior spirit that did that so i'm saying when you have that kind of information that could help you or you you may when you when you look into your history and you find that you have some ancestors who were uh uh, farmers or, or you know business owners or or writers authors you know instead of being instead of gravitating towards um now now if frederick douglas is a direct ancestor of yours like i have a i have a cousin who is related to frederick D douglas because he's uh he's uh his uh his attempted father can trace uh, his lineage back to frederick Douglass, but that doesn't mean that doesn't make me related because it's on a different that you know i'm i'm connected to this cousin through uh the cousins uh through his through his you know attempted mother that's how i'm connected but what i'm saying is there's many of us out there who we don't know if we have a direct connection to frederick Douglass or not but if we have an altar we'll put frederick Douglass on it right or uh you, you might do the same thing with marcus garvey or uh you know even today you might do that with huey newton you know you may have your ancestral altar with malcolm x on it or martin luther king on it but you have no direct ancestral connection no not no direct lineage that that connects you to them it's okay to have them on your altar but 
from my observation, my experience, the power comes from those ancestors who are directly related to you. And, and here's why. Um, it, at least from the Yoruba uh, tribal perspective, one of the things, too, I want to know, I, I mean, I'd like to say to you that I noticed is that the majority of the tribes on the African continent, even, you know, their traditional African belief systems were very similar. They may have uh, used a different name to represent the same energy, but uh, the concepts that they used were were pretty much the same. Right. And if you pick up um, Chancellor Williams, the destruction of black civilization, the destruction of black civilization by Chancellor Williams, he details how the uh, racist white supremacists ran people out of Kemet. OK. For I think it was, it was about like a, a, a 10,000 year period where they just kept trying to take over Kim. OK, ever since they found out it was like the source of knowledge and the cradle of civilization, uh, you know, the the uh, Greeks did not want that to happen. The Greeks and the Romans did not want that to happen. So they kept uh, doing whatever they can to steal the knowledge and at the same time destroy the knowledge, the source of the knowledge so that they could make it appear as if they were the source of the knowledge. Okay, well, in that process, um, when, they, when they finally took over Kemet, they ran a lot of people out. And according to Chancellor Williams's book, those people who ran out of Kemet were the ones who formed different tribes. Okay, they 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 ran out of Kemet, Kemet with nothing, damn near nothing. Like many of them couldn't even leave with clothes, right? And 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 food. So many of them were, were run into the jungle and uh, had to become primitive. They, they had to resort to becoming primitive because they had no more access to most of the knowledge um, and, and they had to try to memorize the knowledge orally instead of uh, written like it once was in Kemet. So they had to uh, try to memorize what they, what they knew and pass that on to the next generation. Okay, so in the case of the Yoruba, the one who came from that, uh, his name is Oduduwa. You know, so just do some research on him. O d u d u w a Oduduwa. Um, but he is the founder of the Yoruba tribe, and according to Yoruba history, he came from the north, right? Which is where Kemet uh, would would be, would have been. Um, then you have another book called Stolen Legacy by um, let's see here. I, I, I might as well. I'm talking about them. I should. Uh, try to. out of it right so let's do this we're gonna go to amazon and we are going to Oh, they have it on, uh, they have it as a audio book too. Stolen Legacy, Greek 
no, no, wait, yeah, George James. Greek philosophy is stolen Egyptian philosophy. Let's see if I can link this. All right, so I'm gonna put this link in the chat. Uh, if you if you uh, would like to support me, support this broadcast, uh, click on that link and uh, purchase the audio book uh, from Amazon. I'd appreciate that if you did that. Okay, looks like I couldn't get it through on Facebook. Okay, but anyway, so we're talking about the knowledge of uh, veneration, the veneration of our dead. And when, when you think about it, right, they encourage us to destroy one another. They encourage us to constantly uh, terrorize one another through the smallest conflict right and any per any person if if your ancestor is in greater confinement for 30 40 something years what what can their spirit do for you if their if their spirit has spent so much time away from gaining any type of knowledge or experience, right? Or if that ancestor uh, experiences a sudden death that they die early, right? How then can that ancestor be able to share with you well, I, I'm speaking in, in you know, I'm, I'm going, like, I, I, I want you to, to, to understand that, you know, your ancestors, those who have lived a long time, those who have who've breathed air for a long time and have, a, have been able to, um, you know, acquire uh, knowledge and, and experience in certain areas uh, are spirits that you can tap into. And I'm saying that um, I believe that it's extremely important for you to get a hold of the names of your ancestors and be able to uh, set up a way to tap into those energies um, to help you, right? And at the same time, it helps you accumulate a knowledge of, of history within your specific family that I think can help you pass on constructive information for other individuals, especially the youth, right? It, it gives the youth uh, another point of view. Just imagine what that could be like if when you're, uh, yeah, I, I hope that you do this because, you know, it helps children a lot is, you know, to sit down uh, with the with the offspring and and tell them stories, tell them bedtime stories. But imagine being able to tell your children bedtime stories about a relative, you know, somebody that uh, you learned about or somebody that you knew that accomplished uh great things you know or they, they solve some problems right because in, in i mean ultimately that's what we'd be looking for when you uh venerate your ancestors is for them to help you solve problems it's it's so easy for you to understand where i'm coming from if you just do it, <laughs> uh, 
if you just did it right now i'm, I'm i want to say I, I was against uh the tearing down of statues but now i'm for it I, I when i think about it if the statues that exist today that continue to exist today are statues of racist ancestors and the people who built that statue built that statue for the purpose of that ancestor remaining on the minds of people who choose to practice racism if, if they remember that racist ancestor and they say oh yeah i remember he did this and this now we shouldn't forget about those ancestors no i think we should always remember those ancestors and the uh, racist acts that were committed by them so that uh, we know what racism is and how it works and be able to explain it to the youth so that they know it as well. But we cut out all veneration of them. You get rid of the statues, you know. Um, so, but yeah, so here we go. I just want to show you all something because I, I hear a lot of talk right i hear a lot of talk about um what the so-called asians are doing and what the so-called mexicans are doing and how they got this going on and everybody gets help but us everybody gets help but the negro right and hold on let's see i gotta look this up wait destruction i'm gonna put the make sure the destruction i bet now, I would be totally blown away if the destruction of black civilization has audio. I will be blown away. Let's see. Civilization. I'll be damned. They got that in audio, too? Wow. Wow. So I just want to say too, you know, I don't know if somebody wants to take it upon themselves to do it, but somebody may want to uh, verify that these uh, are just like the original books. I mean, you know, probably take some time to do that, but this this right here is amazing to me. That uh, this would be on audio book, but let's see here. Let me grab the text to that this is the short link to the destruction of black civilization if you if you click on that link to uh, purchase the audio of the destruction of black civilization I greatly support uh, appreciate your support because, uh, you know, that would help me out if you click on that link through me. Um, but now, um, if you if you have your own ancestors, if you have a altar that's dedicated to your own ancestors, I believe that that will help you accomplish a lot of things. A lot of the issues and things that you want to accomplish, uh, I believe that they can help you. Power play for real. What's happening with you? Welcome, welcome. I'm just going to show you. We're going to go to the uh, white man's uh, good housekeep stamp of approval because many of you won't um you won't even look at it unless i present it to you that way but here we are if we type in veneration of the dead right it says the veneration of the dead including one's ancestors is based on love and respect for the deceased in some cultures remember culture just means what you do right what you say what you how you think, uh, how you speak, how you act, or how you don't think, how you, you know, 
don't speak, how you don't act, all comes under the term culture. It is related to beliefs that the dead have a continued existence and may possess the ability to influence the fortune of the living. This is the part right here I'm talking about. See, now I, I just found it on Wiki. Okay, because I know what I'm talking about is very common. It's it's extremely common. And this is something that we lack, but we, we're always talking about like, uh, you know, why do the Chinese, you know, so-called Chinese and the Asians uh, get things done, right? You know, why, why do they have their own businesses and, and uh, they, they uh, you know, have their own so-called community or whatever. We see them, we, we see them working together and then we look at black people and we don't see black people working together. Well, this might be one of the reasons because they all share this process of uh, venerating their ancestors. See this part right here? I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it again. And may possess the ability to influence the fortune of the living. This right here is what's been happening for me ever since I started venerating my ancestors in, what was that, 1990? Uh, it was 19, I think it was 1991 when I first started calling on my ancestors, but... Uh, I'd say around 95 is when I when I started assimilating, uh, assembling an altar. OK, some groups venerate their direct familial ancestors, certain sects and religion, in particular, the Eastern Orthodox Church and Roman Catholic Church venerate saints as intercessors with God. And the latter also believes in the prayer for departed souls in purgatory. Now. This part right here, understand that the Roman Catholic Church acquired its knowledge from the Romans, okay? And the Romans acquired their knowledge from the Greeks, and the Greeks acquired their knowledge from Kemet. You'll learn that if you read both those, you listen to the audio books, both the audio books that I just presented to you will speak about that. OK. Well, they'll speak about more about the Greeks and the Romans and how they learned from Kemet. Um, not so much about how they became the Catholic Church, but um, the Catholic Church was started by uh, Emperor Constantine, who, uh, you know, became a Christian. He uh, organized the uh, religion. Uh, of uh, Christianity at the Council of Nicaea or whatever, but that turned into the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, so again, it says venerate saints as intercessors with God. The latter also believes in prayer for departed souls in purgatory. Now, Purgatory, what would that mean? So the part of souls of many religion and philosophical traditions, there is a belief that a soul is the in, immaterial aspect of an essence of a human being. Just understand that this information is what they were teaching in Kemet. Okay. Now, purgatory, this is the place that I believe... Uh, you know, be, because of the behavior that uh, they've been encouraging a lot of our people to do while they're here on the planet, they've been going to purgatory. That's another story. Anyway, other religious groups, however, consider veneration of the dead to be idolatry and a sin. And this is where I think some of you are stuck at, right? You, you, you've given up on Christianity, but you're still thinking about idolatry and sin maybe not much of a sin but maybe you're just thinking about idolatry and um 
you know, it makes you think, well, that's primitive and I'm not primitive. I want to be modern or something like that. You know, I don't know, but um, it's it's my belief that you should try something if it works. If it helps you solve your problems, you know, you should try it. And I'm telling you, it will help you solve some of your problems, okay? In European, Asian, Oceanian, you know, you know these confusing terms here, African and Afro-diasporic cultures, the goal of ancestor veneration is to ensure the ancestors' continued well-being and positive disposition towards the living, and sometimes to ask for special favors and assistance. The social and non-religious function of ancestor veneration is to cultivate kinship values such as filial piety. I don't know what that is. Let's see what they say. In Confucianism, Chinese Buddhism, and Taoist ethics, filial piety is a virtue of respect for one's parents, elders, and ancestors. So uh, family loyalty and the continuity continuity of family lineage. So this is what I want you to think about. If, if you think about your family, the current condition of your so-called family. Like, um, I, was, uh, I was having a conversation with someone the other day and this is something I have I have observed myself um, with, you know, people in my own family. But uh, this person was telling me that when their mother passed away, um, their uh, fa their family members went against their mother's wishes. Right. The mother, uh, you know, said that they all need to get along. Uh, you know, after she passes and as soon as she passed on, the family members went at each other's throats over uh, material things that uh, the mother had left behind, right? I've seen this happen to black people on numerous occasions, right? Like I said, within my family, within other people's families, but it happens. You have all these, you know, these siblings that, uh, you know, especially in my family, I had two uh, cousins that that uh, appeared to be the best. They were like best friends. They appeared to be like best friends. You know, they're siblings, but they were like best friends. They were like two peas in a pod. You would see, you wouldn't see one without the other. But as soon as their mother passed away, they became enemies, you know? But imagine if there's an ancestral altar in which you venerate the ancestors, the grandparents, the great-great-grandparents, you know, everybody who's on the other side and you're recognizing them for what they've done and uh, the... the uh, the solutions to certain problems in your within your family that they've already solved that you know that information is being passed down to you imagine what that could do in in the family see this is what i'm talking about christine says teach we need all the help we can get our ancestors are key to helping solve some of our problems You know, and, and I, I can bear witness that Christine has has told me that she has done that. You know, she she has uh, went and, and went ahead and set up an altar. Um, and, you know, that's based on uh, information that I've shared with her. And um, I just I just want you all to know, I really think that this is this can be uh, constructive in helping you. So then we got uh, the continues. It says uh, 
ancestor veneration occurs in societies with every degree of social, political, and technological complexity, and it remains an important component of various religious practices in modern times. And so here, you know, you, they listen here, they, they say West and Southeast African cultures and uh, Senegal, Madagascar, Asian cultures, Cambodia, China, offerings, India. See, this is all over the planet. Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Myanmar, Philippines, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Vietnam, European cultures, right? The, 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 Europe, the racist white supremacists have us venerate their ancestors every year, right? President, uh, President's Day, you're honoring who? You're honoring their ancestors, George Washington, who was definitely, most definitely a racist suspect with the amount of slaves he owned, three, him and his wife together owned 300 slaves. And then and Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln, he didn't own any slaves, but he said that uh, he believed that white people were superior to black people in his uh, his debate against uh, Stephen Douglas. I think his name is Stephen Douglas. Uh, another white person. Okay. So uh, they have us venerate their ancestors every year. But all of these places and in here, ancient cultures. So let's start with this first. We'll go, we'll go to ancient Egypt, which is Kemet, and see what they say, right? Let's see what these people say here. And of course, when you get the destruction of black civilization by Chancellor Williams and stolen legacy by uh, George James, you will have detailed evidence to support what's being said here and you'll even know if this is being said is is uh is accurate or not okay but it says although some historians claim that ancient egyptian again that was the just so you know uh the people of kemet called themselves called their place kim and kemet um the uh greeks renamed the place Egypt and called them Egyptians. But, uh, and you'll find that out, I believe, in Stolen Legacy. Uh, and and uh, both, both the books that I mentioned, you'll find it in there. But anyway, claim that ancient Egyptian society was a death cult because of its elaborate tombs and mummification rituals. It was the opposite, okay? The philosophy that this world is but a veil of tears and that to die and be with God is a better existence than an earthly one was relatively unknown among the ancient Egyptians. This was not to say that they were unacquainted with the harshness of life. Rather, their ethos included a sense of continuity between this life and the next. The Egyptian people loved the culture, customs, and religion of their daily lives so much that they wanted to continue them in the next. Although some might hope for a better station in the beautiful West, Egyptian afterlife. Okay, I, I them calling this the beautiful West. I, I, um, I dispute that already. But um, being, you know, heading to the afterlife is heaven. Okay. Uh, tombs were housing in the hereafter, and so they were carefully constructed and decorated just as homes for the living were. Mummification was a way to preserve the corpse to the ka, the soul, which, you know, we were speaking of earlier, I, I, refer, I refer to it as ori, of the deceased could return to receive offerings of the things she he enjoyed while alive. Okay, so... Your altar, your ancestral uh, altar would be just like a pyramid or a tomb. It would be just like that um, in, in the, in the uh, aspect of where you would make offerings for your ancestors, right, to return. So if mummification was not affordable, a Ka statue 
in the likeness of the deceased was carved for this purpose. So here we go. Here's here's where they we were just talking about removing why I agreed with removing uh, uh, statues of, of uh, racist spirits. Here, here we go. We got something here. The blessed dead were collectively called the Anku or shining ones. They were described as shining as gold in the belly of nut and were indeed depicted as golden stars on the roofs of many tombs and temples. Okay, so um, I can't remember where I heard the proverb, but I there was a proverb that I heard that, um, you know, every star in the universe represents the uh, the soul of a person. Anyway, the process by which Ka became an Ak was not automatic upon death. It involved a 70-day journey through the Duat or other world, which led to judgment before Wesir, Osiris, Lord of the Dead, where the Ka's heart would be weighted on a scale against the feather of Maya, representing truth. Okay? Now... This right here has a lot to do to me with uh, establishing good character. Okay. That, that's uh, having a character that's based on truth. You know how in the code it says uh, self-respect means never lying to yourself. Okay. It says, however, if the car was not properly prepared, this journey could be fraught with dangerous pitfalls and strange demons. Hence, some of the earliest religious texts discovered, such as the Papyrus of Ani, commonly known as the Book of the Dead, and the Pyramid Text, were actually written as guides to help the deceased successfully navigate the Duat. Okay, that's interesting. And so Duat kind of reminds me of uh, Duel says the god Osiris was believed to be the lord of the underworld. He was the first mummy as depicted in the Osiris myth. So if the Ka was not properly prepared, this journey could be fraught with dangerous pitfalls and strange demons. So I'm thinking here about these strange demons. What if and these dangerous pitfalls, what if venerating your ancestors was to help you avoid the dangerous pitfalls and these strange demons what if these strange demons are like the trauma that you experience the, the, the trauma that you experience from certain events that happen to you what if that's what a demon is right If the heart was in balance with the feather of Maya, the Ka passed judgment and was granted access to the beautiful West as an Ankh who was Maya Heru, true of voice, to dwell among the gods and other Ankh. At this point, only was the Ka deemed worthy to be venerated by the living through rites and offerings. Okay. So you, the objective is to get to the point to where your ori is venerated by living by 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 the living right so if we think about our ancestors and if our ancestors were deemed worthy of being venerated but most of we we don't know if our ancestors have been deemed worthy to be venerated because we don't know we don't even know anything about them most of us don't know anything about our the ancestors in our direct lineage right but rites and offerings these are things that you could be doing if you set up your altar those who became lost in the duat or deliberately tried to avoid judgment became the unfortunate and sometimes dangerous mutu the restless dead well, see that's who i think is I, I i think there's a lot of racist uh suspect spirits out there who are this who become this part they're the restless dead
For the few whose truly evil hearts outweighed the feather, the goddess Amit waited patiently behind Wasir's judgment seat to consume them. She was a composite creature resembling three of the deadliest animals in Egypt. Besides being eaten by Amit, the worst fate a Ka could suffer after physical death was to be forgotten. So just, I mean, just think about that. If that, if this is true, if you have, you have ancestors in your direct lineage that you have forgotten, you don't know anything about, you're not venerating them, right? You, you've been brain trashed into believing that uh, allowing them to rest and not calling them is what causes you to forget them, right? You, you don't pass on what you know to the next generation and the next generation doesn't learn about them, right? I think that's very interesting. For this reason, ancestor veneration in ancient Egypt was an important rite of remembrance in order to keep the Ka alive in this life as well in the next. Now, in the traditional African belief system that I practice, your Ori, which is talking about the Ka here, it, it, which they refer to as the Ka, passes on from generation to generation in your lineage. Right. So it's, it's like when you're if your lineage dies out, then there's no more of your spirit. Your spirit does, no longer uh, exists. Right. Because it, it does not uh, have a vessel to come back into. And because it's kind, kind of like a, a reincarnation, a combination of, of reincarnation. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's like reincarnation of your Ori within your family lineage, within your direct bloodline. That's that's the way it works, right? The way it's said to have worked. So if you don't venerate or remember your own ancestors, right? And, and then at the same time, recognizing that, you know, in the past, some of your ancestors, you were, you, you're, you, you have a direct connection to them, your DNA, is in them their dna is in you and then you have your future offspring that's going to have the dna from all of you these are all uh, uh you know each each piece of depth of of dna represents a part of your soul a part of that ori that was in that ancestor that experienced those experience in the past right and by you continuing to have more uh offspring you're guaranteeing, uh, and, and not only just offspring, but prosperous offspring, right? You're solving your problems, right? Um, and I don't think anybody has ever attempted, well, I don't know for sure, but it, I think it would be extremely constructive if there was a group of, of us who were using our ancestors in the way to help us uh, fight white supremacy or help us overcome white supremacy. Um, I just don't believe anybody's ever done that. I don't, I mean, if they have, I don't, you know, I haven't, I haven't heard of it, but I mean, it doesn't mean I know everything. I could be incorrect, but um, just in case I'm talking about it. So, so that's, you know, the purpose of this broadcast today is to encourage you to do this, to uh, use your own ancestors and your direct lineage to help you, uh, in this process of replacing the system of racism, white supremacy with a system of justice. Okay. But then we go, we continue on. It says royals, nobles, and the wealthy made contracts with their local priests to perform prayers and give offerings at their tombs. Now, this is something that I can do, you know, as, as a, uh, you know, priest who's been initiated in the, uh, Afro Cuban, uh, religion of Lukumi in Matanzas, back in Matanzas, Cuba, 2019, I've learned how to do this. So these are things that I can do. I can help you learn uh, the prayers and and help you learn how to do uh, what off offerings to give to your altars, 
um, you know, to help your help you with your ancestors. It says in return, the priests were allowed to keep a portion of the offerings as payment for services rendered. Some tomb inscriptions even invited passersby to speak aloud the names of the deceased within, which also helped to perpetuate their memory and to offer water, prayers, and other things if they so desire. And this is, it, you know, it's um, when you when you approach the altar, there's there's the terms, there's you know terms that you can. There, there's a whole process of of naming, calling out the names of your ancestors that can help, right? When I first started, um, I didn't know the names of most of my ancestors. When I had the altar that I started, I just called out to my ancestors, those in my direct lineage. And over the years, they've revealed their names to me through, you know, through different uh, situations, but they revealed their names to me. They revealed pictures of themselves to me um, just by going through the research that I've gone through uh, in researching my ancestors. It's led me in, in certain directions. So, you know, I've compiled a whole list of my ancestors that I can call on and I can show you how to do that. Okay. Um, what else we got here? What else we got here? So this is some tomb inscriptions even invited passes by. Okay. And offer water prayers. Let's see. In the private homes of the less wealthy, niches were carved into the walls for the purpose of housing images of familiar Aku and to serve as altars of veneration. Many of these same religious beliefs and ancestor veneration practices are still carried on today in the religion of Kemetic orthodoxy okay then we have ancient rome who you know i'm pretty sure this right here is not going to say they got it from Kemet, but uh they did they got it from the greeks and the greeks took it from them but it says the romans like many mediterranean societies regarded the bodies of the dead as polluting during rome's classical period the body was most often cremated and the ashes placed in the tomb outside the city walls much of the month of February was devoted to purifications, propitiation, and veneration of the dead, especially at the nine-day festival of the Parentula, during which a family honored its ancestors. The family visited the cemetery and shared cake and wine, both in the form of offerings to the dead and as meal as a meal among themselves. And this this right here um, is very close to what a lot of uh mexicans do a lot of mexican families uh they practice what's called dia de los muertos which is the day of the dead and they do this they go to the cemetery and you know oftentimes they share you know a meal uh with uh, some dead relatives right and then we have the parentalia drew to a close on february 21st uh, with the more somber Ferelia, a public festival of sacrifices and offerings to the Manes, the potentially malevolent spirits of the dead who required propitiation. Uh, uh, one of the most common inscriptional phrases on Latin uh, epitaphs is Dis Manubus, abbreviated DM for the Manus gods, which appears even on some Christian tombstones. Okay, and I'm going to move down. It says the noble Roman family displayed ancestral images in the tablu tablinium of their homes. Some sources indicate these portraits were busts, while others suggest the funeral masks were also displayed. The mask probably modeled of wax from the, the face of the deceased. So some of y'all who, you know, won't do nothing unless the... Uh, uh, Without the white man's approval, here's the evidence. Uh, you know, if you believe that Romans were people classified as white, that they do it too, right? So we started with them. Now I'm going to go. Back up here. And we'll go to. Islam. So Islam has a complex and mixed view on the area of graves, shrines, and ancestor worship. The graves of many early Islamic figures are holy sites for Muslims, including Ali, 
and a cemetery with many companions and early caliphs. Many other mausoleums are major architectural, political, and cultural sites, including the National Mausoleum in Pakistan and the Taj Mahal in India. However, the religious movement of Wahhabism disputes the concept of saint veneration. Followers of this movement have destroyed many grave site shrines, including in Saudi Arabia and in territory controlled by the Islamic State. Right, they've, these uh, um, individuals of Wahhabism have considered it to be uh, idolism, you know. So they, but here you go. So you got even amongst people who practice Islam, some who do it, others who don't. But I want us to focus on those who do, right? And we got North America, so I guess they're going to talk about what maybe the Native Americans or something. Let's see. Or the day, day is, oh, here, Day of the Dead. So. In the United States and Canada, flowers, wreaths, grave decorations, and sometimes candles, food, small pebbles, or items the dead valued in life are put on graves year-round as a way to honor the dead. These traditions originate in the diverse cultural backgrounds of the current populations of both countries. In the United States, many people honor deceased loved ones who were in the military on Memorial Day, days with uh, religious and spiritual significance like Easter, Christmas, Candlemas, and All, All Souls Day, Day of the Dead, and Samhan are also times when relatives and friends of the deceased may gather at the graves of their loved ones. In the Catholic Church, one's local parish church often offers prayers for the dead on their death anniversary of All Souls Day. So let's see was candle mass candle mass also known as the feast of the presentation of jesus christ the feast of the purification of the blessed virgin mary or the feast of the holy encounter is a christian holiday commemorating the presentation of jesus so you know of course everything uh, is supposed to go through jesus and all that which you know anyway uh all souls they are also known as the commemoration of all the faithful departed and the day of the dead Celebrated on the 1st and 2nd, though other days such as October 31st, November 6th may be included depending on the locality. It's largely originated in Mexico where it is mostly observed, right? And then what's Samhan? is a Gaelic festival marking the end of the harvest season and beginning of winter. Gaelic is a language that's spoken in um, Ireland, I believe. Memorial Day is a federal holiday for remembering the remembering the deceased, right? So you know many of you do this already. You know, in the 147 national cemeteries like Arlington and Gettysburg, it is common for volunteers to place small American flags at each grave. In Judaism, when a grave site is visited, a small pebble is placed on the headstone. While there is no clear answer as to why this custom of leaving pebbles may date back to biblical days when individuals were buried under piles of stones. Today, they are left as tokens that people have been there to visit, to remember. I'm going to go ahead and move past that and we'll go to okay samhan november 1st in ireland and scotland the dead are thought to return to the world of the living and offerings of food and light are left for them on the festival day ancient people would extinguish the hearth fires in their homes participate in a community bonfire festival see you got all these people doing this but not black people right the mo most black people uh, in the United States aren't doing this. Okay, I can guarantee it. And I'm just saying it may be something that could help us. You know, when you look at these other people on the planet doing what they're doing, perhaps this helps them. You know? In Catholic countries in Europe, continued later with the Anglican Church in England, November 1st, All Saints Day became known and is 
still known as the day to specifically venerate those who have died and who have been deemed official saints. You know, the day of the dead is the day when all the faithful dead are remembered. On that day, families go to cemeteries to light candles for their dead relatives, leave them flowers, and often pick often to picnic. So we look at Vietnam. Ancestor veneration is one of the most unifying aspects of Vietnamese culture, as practically all Vietnamese, regardless of their religious affiliation, Buddhist, Catholic, or animist, have an ancestor altar in their home or business. This looks similar to my altar, right? I mean, I don't have the Asian style on it, but uh, I have food. I, I offer food on my altar. I have pictures of my ancestors. and You know, here's fruit, you know, incense. I, I burn incense when I venerate them. Here's uh look, here's their offerings to their ancestors on on New Year's, a New Year offering, old man in traditional dress, you know. And uh I, I wear a traditional dress uh dealing with them. It's all white, which you know I highly recommend that uh you do when you approach your ancestors. Um it's not required, but it I think it enhances the communication Thailand in rural northern Thailand a religious ceremony honoring ancestral spirits known as Phan Phi spirit dance or ghost dance takes place it includes offerings for ancestors with spirit mediums sword fighting spirit possessed dancing and spirit mediums cockfighting in a spiritual cockfight don't know what that means, but it's the way that they do it. Sri Lanka, making offerings to one's ancestors is connected on the sixth day after death as a part of traditional Sri Lankan funeral rites. Philippines, in the animistic indigenous religions, is of course, you know, they got a, when they animism, the belief that objects, places, and creatures all possess a distinct spiritual essence. I don't know why they would call it animism. Well, well, maybe to confuse, right? But uh, if you're one who is spiritual and you believe that uh, everything in the universe is connected in some kind of way through some type of energy, then I guess by their definition, you would be an animist. I guess I would be one. This is indigenous religions of the pre-colonial pre-colonial that means pre-white supremacy philippines ancestor spirits were one of the two major types of spirits with whom they say shamans right which communicate ancestor spirits were known as umalagad guardian or caretaker they can be the spirits of actual ancestors or generalized guardian spirits of a family ancient filipinos believed that upon death the soul of a person travels usually by boat to a spiritual world there can be multiple locations in the spirit world varying in different ethnic groups which place souls end up in depends on how they die the age of at death or con conduct of the person when they were alive souls reunite with deceased relatives in the underworld and lead normal lives in the underworld as they did in the material world in some cases the souls of evil people undergo penance and cleansing before they are granted entrance into the particular spirit realm this right here this is this is uh purgatory right if you it, purgatory would be like if you think of the movie ghost right i don't know if you've all if you all have ever seen the movie ghost but i'd if you haven't watch it where you know the character um played by patrick swayze when he's murdered instead of him going to heaven he sticks around on the earth because he's trying to uh get a message to his wife 
right? And, you know, uh, ultimately, it was something I think he needed to tell her before he moved on. Well, there's a lot of spirits like this, right? Um, and I, I believe that uh, these these types types of spirits uh, are out there. Uh, you know, they they harass me a lot. I can't say I don't want to call it harassment, but there there's a lot that uh, you know, they, they, they they just say a lot. Okay. A lot that they talk about, and um, oftentimes I don't quite understand what they're saying to me because because I don't know I don't know I don't know anything about them. I mean I know you know I, I can see what they're telling me, I can see what they're talking about, um, but as far as uh, you, you know, knowing who the message is that they're giving me, knowing who the message is for is where i have uh issues but that's another you know anyway souls would eventually reincarnate after a period of time in the spirit world so you know this is very similar souls in the spirit will still retain a degree of influence in the material world and vice versa uh pa paganito rituals well you can see the word pagan in there so we know that that's uh says anito also spelled anut anitu refers to ancestor spirits uh, natural spirit, nature spirits, and deities in the indigenous Philippine folk religions from the pre colonial age. Rituals may be used to invoke good ancestral spirits for protection, intercession, or advice. Vengeful spirits of the dead can manifest as apparitions or ghosts and cause harm to the living. Paganito can be used to appease or banish them. Ancestor spirits also figured prominently uh, pre pre prominently during illness or death as they were believed to be the ones who call the soul to the underworld, guide the soul, or this is a cycle pomp, or meet the soul upon arrival. Ancestor spirits are also known as Kaladin among the Cordillerians. The indigenous peoples of the Cordillera, Cordillera mountain range of northern Luzon, Philippines, are often referred to using the exonym Igorot people. Tonang among the Magudanao, Maguin, Maguin Danao, and the Maranao. So these are tribes, these are tribal people in the Philippines. Umba among the Sama Baja and Ninuno among Tagalogs and Nono among the Bicolanos. Ancestor spirits are usually represented by carved figures called Tao Tao. Those were carved, these were carved by the community upon a person's death. Every household had a Tao Tao stored in a shelf in the corner of the house. The predominantly Roman Catholic Filipino people still hold ancestors in particular esteem, though without the formality uh, common to their neighbors, despite having been Christianized since coming into contact with Spanish missionaries in 1521. In the present day, ancestor veneration is expressed in having photographs of the dead by the home altar, a common fixture in many Filipino Christian homes. Candles are often kept burning before the photographs, which are sometimes decorated with garlands of fresh sampaguita, the national flower. Ancestors, particularly dead parents, are still regarded as psychopomps, as a dying person is said to be brought to the afterlife by the spirits of dead relatives. Let's go back up here and see what that psychopomp is. Are creatures, spirits, angels, demons, or deities in many religions whose responsibility is to escort newly deceased souls from earth to the afterlife? The role is not to judge the deceased, but simply to guide them. I believe that is what the Orisha or uh, Oya does in, um, in Lukumi. 
believe that's her position in, in the Kumi. I could be incorrect, but let's see. Filipino Catholic and Anglipayan veneration of the dead finds its greatest expression in the Philippines is the hollow mass, kind of like Halloween, between, look, season between October 31st and November 2nd. So this is like that All Saints, All Souls Day. Oh, there it is down there. Variously called Undas, based on the word for the first. The Spanish Andas, or possibly Honra, Todos Los Santos, All Saints, and sometimes Aro Imang, Munga Pate, I think that's how you say it, Day of the Dead, which refers to the following solemnity of All Souls Day. So I'm just saying, you know, what if, what if this is the one, this is one of the things that's missing from us? Chinese Filipinos, meanwhile, have the most apparent and distinct customs related to ancestor veneration carried over from traditional Chinese religion and most often melded with their current Catholic faith. Many still burn incense and kim at family tombs and before photos at home while they incorporate Chinese practices into masses held during the All Souls Day period. Myanmar. Ancestor worship in modern day Myanmar is largely confined to some ethnic minority communities, but mainstream remnants of it still exist, such as worship of Obogai. Traditionally refers to the name of a guardian spirit unique to each Burmese Buddhist temple or pagoda. Bobo guy is typically depicted as a nearly life-sized elderly man dressed in a curved cap and sometimes carrying a cane to signify old age. Let's see. Offerings of scarves and paso are common by worshipers. There are many Bobo guy shrines throughout the country and some are more widely respected than others okay well we have the image there but if all these people are doing it what's 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 going on with you why ain't you doing it korea ancestor veneration is referred to by the generic term jere hanja jessa hanja and just so you know, the Yoruba term, uh, tribal term for ancestors is Egungun, right? And the altar that we have is usually referred to as your Egun. Um, and, you know, in Spanish, they, uh, I, believe, I think they call it a Boveda, right? But here is a Korean ancestral altar. Notable examples, it says, include Moon, Moon Mayo, Moon Mill, Jerry, and Jong Mill, Jerry, which are performed periodically each year for venerated Confucian scholars and kings of ancient times, respectively. The ceremony held on the anniversary of a family member's death is called Charye. It is still practiced today. The majority of Catholics, Buddhists, and non-believers practice ancestral rites, although Protestants do not. Protestant, that is a religious belief system that uh, originated out of England when uh, King James decided to protest against the Catholic Church. And he started the Protestant religion. The Catholic ban on ancestral rituals was lifted in 1939. Interesting. They probably wanted everybody just to uh, worship their, uh, their saints until 1939 when the Catholic Church formally recognized ancestral, ri ancestral rites as a civil practice. Ancestral rites are typically divided into three categories. 
Tea rites held four times a year on major holidays. Household rites held the night before an ancestor's death anniversary. Also called seasonal rites held for ancestors who are five or more generations removed. Typically performed annually at the 10th lunar month. Now I want you to think about that. Isn't Wouldn't that be the reason that a birth date would be so significant? It seems to me that that's the only reason why a birth date is really significant. Birth, birth date and the death date would be significant in that it's something that you use to recognize an ancestor. Oh, you know what? I forgot about my connection here. That could be the problem, too. Japan, before the introduction of Buddhism to Japan, ancestor worship and funerary rites were not common, especially for non-elites. In the Qing period, abandonment was a common method of disposing of the dead. Following the advent of Buddhism, rituals were sometimes performed at the gravesite, after burial or cremation. Indonesia. In Indonesia, ancestor worship has been a tradition of some of the indigenous people. Podam of, of the Toba Batak, Waruga of the Minahasans, and the coffins of the Karo people are a few examples. Toluva culture in Tulu Nadu. Toluvas have the ancestor worship in the name of Buddha Kola. And you've got Pitru Paksha in Indian origin, apart from this. There is also a fortnight long duration each year called Pitru Paksha, fortnight of the ancestors, when the family remembers all its ancestors and offers tarpan to them. Palia in Gujarat, the Palia memorial stones are associated with ancestor worship in Western India. These memorials are worshiped by people of associated community or descendants of a person on special days such as death day of person event anniversaries festivals auspicious days in kartika shravana or bad drapada months of hindu calendar these memorials are washed with milk and water on though on these days they are smeared with sindur or kumkum powder used for social and religious markings and flowers are scattered over it the earthen lamp is lighted near it with sesame oil sometimes a flag is erected over it and we have something here rakagari and Indus Valley Civilization site in Haryana, the lovers' skeletons of a man between 35 and 40 years old and women in early 20s were found who were likely married to each other and buried together. Their grave contained pots, which likely carried food and water as offering to the dead. Here we go. The Ahom religion is based on ancestor worship. The Ahoms believe that a man after his death remains as Dom, ancestor, only for a few days and soon he becomes Fi, God. They also believe that the soul of a man, which is immortal, unites with the supreme soul, possesses the qualities of a spiritual being and always blesses the family. So every Ahom family, in order to worship the dead, establish a pillar 
on the opposite side of the kitchen, which is called Damkuta, where they worship the dead with various offerings like homemade wine, ma paste, rice with various items of meat and fish. Medan Mefi, a ritual centered on commemorating the dead, is celebrated by the Ahom people on the 31st of January every year in memory of the departed. And then here we got, you know, listing other, I guess the rest of India. Ancestors are widely revered, honored, and venerated in India and China. The spirit of a dead person is called Pitris, which is venerated. When a person dies, the family observes a 13-day mourning period, generally called Srada. A year thence, they observe the ritual of Tarpan in which the family makes offerings to the deceased. During these rituals, the family prepares the food items that the deceased liked and offers food to the deceased. This is more along the lines of what I encourage you to do. They offer this food to crows as well as certain days that it is believed that the soul comes in the form of a bird to taste it. And this part, I, I kind of believe in, I, like, um, in the the week that my um, that my attempted father died in uh, in 2010, when he in that week, uh, my house at the time was like it, it was on the outside, but a whole flock of sparrows moved into our attic right you know you see them chirping and stuff and and you know flying in and out of the there was like a hole that they had made up there um and nests they had built nests like uh out, out, along the edge of the roof you know outside along the edge and they were just all over the place and i always uh felt that that was uh because of the spirit of my father because uh he loved birds he really loved birds he loved birds a lot so uh anyway uh only after these rituals are the family members allowed to eat it is believed that this reminds the ancestor spirits that they are not forgotten and are loved so it brings them to peace and this is very similar to uh what i learned you know if, if i cook a meal I share part of that meal with the ancestors um, before I eat. Uh, on Shraddha days, people pray that the souls of the ancestors be appeased, forget any animosity, and find peace. Each year on a particular date, as per the Hindu calendar, when the person had died, the family members repeat this ritual. Indian and Chinese practices of ancestor worship are prevalent throughout Asia as a result of the large Indian and Chinese populations in countries such as Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia, and elsewhere across the, across the continent. Furthermore, the large Indian population in places such as Fiji and Guyana has resulted in these practices spreading beyond their Asian homeland. But see, the thing is, is in, in Fiji, uh, there's indigenous people there and there's indigenous people in Guyana who I'm sure all practice some type of uh, ancestral veneration. I'm showing you this to show you how common it is and how uncommon it is for us, how uncommon it is for black people here in the United States um, because, you know, the racist white supremacists want us to value their ancestors and pay homage to their ancestors um, in, in, in a way to, you know, look upon them as though uh, to solve our problems. You know, if you think about Benjamin Franklin, for example, you know, his, his book is recommended, highly recommended for uh, giving you some constructive information on helping you solve some of your problems, right? Which is, there, there is some constructive information in there. Um, but understand that, you know, when it was written, uh, it most likely was not written for you uh, as a victim of white supremacy. Um, it just made its way to you. In traditional Chinese culture, 
Sacrifices are sometimes made to altars as food for the deceased. This falls under the modes of communication with the Chinese spiritual world concepts. Some of the veneration includes visiting the deceased at their graves and making or buying offerings for the deceased in the spring, autumn, and ghost festivals. Due to the hardships of the late 19th and 20th century China, when meat and poultry were difficult to come by, sumptuous feasts are still offered in some Asian countries as a practice to the spirits or ancestors. However, in the Orthodox, Taoist, and Buddhist rituals, only vegetarian food would suffice. For those with deceased in the afterlife or hell, elaborate or even creative offerings such as servants, refrigerators, houses, car, paper money, and shoes are provided so that the deceased will be able to have these items after they have died. Often, paper versions of these objects are burned for the same purpose. Originally, real-life objects were buried with the dead. In time, these goods were replaced by full-size clay models, which in turn were replaced by scale models on and, and in time today's paper offerings, including paper servants. Okay, now this right here reminds me of what they uh, what it said they were doing to venerate the ancestors in Kemet, right? They believed that certain objects were going to pass on uh, to the afterlife, and they, they put those things in the tomb with, with the dead. This is in China. Ancestor veneration and ancestor worship seek to honor and recollect the actions of the deceased. They represent the ultimate homage to the dead. The importance of paying respect to parents and elders lies with the fact that all physical bodily aspects of one being created by one's parents who continue to tend to one's well-being until one was on firm footing. The respect and homage to parents is to return this gracious deed to them in life and after. See that? The Shi corpse personator was a Zhao dynasty sacrificial representative of the dead relative. During a Shi ceremony, the ancestral spirit supposedly would enter the personator who would eat and drink sacrificial offerings and convey spiritual messages. This is uh, very interesting right here. So, Cambodia says people make offerings to their ancestors. Chom Bin is a time when many Cambodians pay their respects to deceased relatives of up to seven generations. Monks chant the suttas in Pali language overnight continuously without sleeping and prelude uh, to the gates of hell opening, an event that is presumed to occur once a year and is linked to the cosmology of the King Yama originating in the Pali Canon. During this period, the gates of hell are open and ghosts of the dead are presumed to be especially active. In order to combat this, Food offerings are made to benefit them. Some of these ghosts having the opportunity to end their period of pur purgation. That looks like related to purgatory. Whereas others are imagined to leave hell temporarily to then return to endure more suffering without much explanation. Relatives who are not in hell, who are in heaven or otherwise reincarnated are also generally imagined to benefit from the ceremonies. Madagascar, veneration of ancestors is prevalent throughout the island of Madagascar. Approximately half of the country's population of 20 million currently practice traditional religion, which tends to emphasize the links between the living and the Razan, ancestors. The veneration of the ancestors had led to the widespread tradition of tomb building, as well as the highlands practice of Famadina, Fam, Fam, Famadi Hana whereby Famadihana is a funerary tradition of the Malagasy people in Madagascar. During this ceremony known as the turning of the bones, people bring forth the bodies of their ancestors from the family crypts, rewrap the corpses in fresh cloth, and rewrite their names on the cloth. 
whereby a deceased family member's remains may be exhumed to the to be periodically rewrapped in fresh silk shrouds before being replaced in the tomb. The Famadana is an occasion to celebrate the beloved ancestor's memory, reunite with family and community, and enjoy festive atmosphere. Residents of surrounding villages are often invited to attend the party where food and rum are typically served. A Hira, uh, Hira Gacy troop or other mis musical entertainment is commonly presented. Veneration of ancestors is also demonstrated through adherence to Fadi. In Melagasy culture, Fadi are a wide range of cultural prohibitions or taboos. People, places, actions, or uh, objects may be the subject of Fadi, which vary by region within Madagascar. The taboos are believed to be enforced by supernatural powers and are particularly connected with Malagasy ancestor worship. Taboos that are respected during and after the lifetime of the person who establishes them. It is widely believed that by showing respect for ancestors in these ways, they may intervene on behalf of the living. Conversely, misfortunes are often attributed to ancestors whose memory or wishes have been neglected. So what if that was a possible? What if that was something that affected us as a people? Our, what if a lot of our misfortunes come because we've forgotten and neglected our ancestors? What if that's what it is? Or, or like I said, what if it's, uh, what if it's that also combined with, uh, you know, the negative forces of uh, of white supremacy, the the ne negative spiritual forces of white supremacy. It says the sacrifice of Zebu is a traditional method used to appease or honor the ancestors. Small everyday gestures of respect include throwing the first cap full of a newly opened bottle of rum into the northeast corner of the room to give the ancestors their due share. This reminds me of libation, where, you know, uh, you, you pour uh, some water on the ground three times in honor of the uh, ancestors. You know, or pour a little liquor, as uh, Tupac said, you know. Uh, the Sirir people of Senegal, the Gam Gambia and Merchawana, who adhere to the tenets of Afat Ruk, believe in the veneration of the Pangul, ancient Sirir saints and or ancestral spirits. They are various, there are various types of Pangul, each with its own means of veneration. Then we got West and Southeast African cultures. Ancestor veneration is prevalent throughout Africa and, excuse me, and serves as a basis of many religions. It is often augmented by belief in the Supreme Being, but prayers and or sacrifices are usually offered to the ancestors who may ascend to becoming a kind of minor deities themselves. Ancestor veneration remains among many Africans, sometimes practiced alongside the latter adapt adapted religions of Christianity, as in Nigeria among the Igbo, also the Yoruba, and Islam among the different Mande peoples and the Bamum and the Bakosi people in much of the continent. Bakosi's of uh, the Bakosi people are in uh, Cameroon. In addition, Serer religion, the Pangul, is venerated by the Serer people. Serer people. Okay, but you you see what I'm saying, right? Let's see what Christine. What? Uh, power play for real said dead presidents of the dollar bills. That's right. That's right. They put them on the dollar bills. Got us really venerating them. We really venerate them. Uh when we talk about our money and what we need to do with the black dollar and all this kind of stuff, right? 
And you see, they never did put Harriet Tubman on there, right? They kept talking about it, but never did put her on there. Christine says, too often we are taught that after the death of our ancestors, it's over. And many times they are forgotten, but they don't want to be forgotten. They want to live on in you. Don't forget them. That's right. That's right, Christine. That's a great way to put it. Great way to put it. And so I want to I want to keep in mind that. Uh, let's see if I can find something, some evidence of it here. Black buying. I remember when a friend of mine, uh, who's you know, called himself Chinese, uh, told me that in the Chinese New Year parade, there's a a, a dance called the Lion Dance. Let's see. we can find it why don't we put in dance see if there's any information on this dance okay so we have a new world encyclopedia let's zoom in on this and see what they're talking about let's see if they tell us what this guy told me that he learned in, uh, in his Asian studies class. But anyway, it says lion dance, traditional Chinese, uh, wu, wu shi is a form of traditional dance in Chinese culture in which performers in a colorful, articulate lion costume create a ritualized and stylized dance for entertainment and spiritual purposes. The history of the lion dance goes back thousands of years and many folk tales seek to explain its origin. Because there were no lions native to China when the dance was developing, the local people developed the lion dance by imitating the movements of animals they knew. And two separate styles of the dance developed, a northern style and a southern style. The northern style tended to be more explosive, incorporating stunts, while the southern style tended to be more stylized with less realistic looking lion costumes. The lion dance continues to be an important part of Chinese culture, and as it has spread around the world with Chinese immigrants, fantastic lions can be seen performing as far away as Mexico, Chile, and Chinese New Year celebrations, and at many other auspicious events. The lion dance is often confused with the dragon dance, but while the lion requires only two people to operate, Dragons require at least three, often as many as 10 or more. According to Chinese folklore, the lion brings good fortunes and protection, providing peace of mind for those who cross its path. History. The lion dance originated in China sometime before the Tang Dynasty. The Chinese have several stories explaining the prominence of the religion, of, of, of the lion dance. One story tells of a great lion in heaven who, like many cats, was curious and playful, always causing mischief. The Jade Emperor was perturbed by this and due to the lion's insubordination had the lion's head chopped off. He then threw the remains out of heaven and down to earth to rot. However, Quan Yin, the goddess of mercy, had seen the entire affair and feeling sorry for the mischievous lion, descended to earth in order to help him. She tied his head back onto his body with an enchanted red ribbon. The ribbon, she said, would frighten away evil spirits and keep the lion safe from harm. Other stories tell of, a tell of specific stories which the lions save people from danger. In one version, a ferocious creature called Neon also sounds sim similar to the word for New Year in Chinese appeared and threatened the people. A lion appeared and frightened it away. The next time the Neon appeared, the lion was not nearby. So a villager dressed up like a lion and successfully frighted frightened the neon away and the tradition of the lion dance developed. Another variation of this story, so the lion who is the king of beasts, defeating an enemy king who attacked with an army of elephants. And yet another version, an unfamiliar creature rescued the emperor one night when he was lost after a battle guiding him back to his troops, descending the animal to his ministers, 
the emperor discovered that his rescuer was a lion. These stories portray the lion as a guardian creature. It is featured in Buddhist lore with the Bodhisattva, Sattva, Manjushi, whatever, riding on the lion's back. There are different variations of lion dance in other Asian cultures. Uh, let's see. The interesting thing is that lions themselves were not native to China. The first lions were brought to China as tribute during the reign of Emperor Shun, 126 to 145 of the Han Dynasty. Where did they find lions at, y'all? Where the only there's only one place on the planet Earth that lions are native to. Look it up. Because the vast majority of people had thus never seen a lion, they based their lion dances on. Let's see. I'm gonna keep on going to see. I'm looking for the lion dances close relations to kung fu and the dancers are often members of local kung fu clubs they practice in their clubs training hard so my chinese friend told me that the lion dance symbolizes the chinese learning martial arts from the african that's what he told me so now the dance that he told me about was a dance involving five lions one uh black lion and four red lions the black lion represented the african and the four red lions represented the chinese and he said in that story that there was a uh a bridge let's see if this one says it says Guangdong is the homeland of the southern or Cantonese style the Cantonese style can be further divided into Fat Shan, Hawk Shan, Crown, uh, Crown, Crane Mountain, Fat Hawk minor style that exhibits a hybrid of Fat Shan and Hawk Shan, Chao Ka minor style performed by practitioners of Chao family style Kung Fu and the Green Lion uh, popular with the Haikian Taiwanese, the South embraced a more stylized version of a lion, often with only two legs and a drape over the back. As the style many Kung Fu schools adapt, it requires powerful moves. See, the lion becomes the representation of the Kung Fu school, and only the most advanced students are allowed to perform. When the dancing lion enters a village or township, it is supposed to pay its respects first at the local temples then to the ancestors at the ancestral hall and finally through the streets to bring happiness to all the people um okay look at this one let's see as he tries to reproduce a more lifelike realistic movements is the hawk sean lion dances typically include three lions of varying colors the lion with the white colored fur is considered to be the oldest of the lions Huh, white colored. Hmm. The lion with the gold yellowish fur is considered to be the middle child. Hmm. Gold, gold yellowish. Looks like I see some evidence of white supremacy here, maybe. I don't know. Uh, and the black colored lion is considered to be the youngest lion. So the performance executing the role of the black lion should use quick movements like a young child. Other styles use other combinations of lion characters. Sometimes liveliness, golden, courage, red, and friendship, green. Okay. So, um, but the, the story that he told me was basically that uh, the red lines were on one side of a bridge and the black line was on the other side of the bridge. And he, the black line crossed the bridge and started doing a bunch of moves. And the red lines copied the moves. And then the black line went back over the bridge. And um, my friend told me that that was representative of how uh, the uh, Africans had taught martial arts to the Chinese. And this was a long time ago uh, when he told me this. And now we're looking on the Internet. and I don't see anything here. So we'll probably have to look it up in a book. There's a book called The Star Raft. This is the book that he told me uh, it was listed in. Let's see if we can find, let's see if we can get the star raft on here. We can find the audio to that. Hmm. Well, here's the book. Here's the book. It says last purchase 
August 3rd, 2008. Huh? Did I purchase this? I guess I don't, I don't know if I got it. Because I have, I still have my original copy of this book. It's interesting. Anyway, let's see if we can uh, give y'all a link to this. Basically, basically, that book will tell you um, ba basically that book will tell you about the uh, connection with China and Africa. See, it says China's encounter with Africa. China's encounter with Africa. So it says the encounter between China. We'll just read this part for you. The encounter between China and Africa, two superficially different regions, had its formal beginning in 1414 when a Ming dynasty uh, admired, uh, excuse me, admiral named Xing He anchored his galleons in East African waters. Thereafter, Chinese traders and laborers forayed into the interior until the period of European colonization. After World War II, as African countries began to attain independence, Peking, Peking, which is the capital of China, a lot of people think it's Hong Kong, but Peking is the capital of China, launched a major diplomatic and economic aid effort on the continent in competition with its Soviet rival. Of the many examples by which the author is the son of British novelist, looks like something something uh they got a typo somewhere in here but uh the son of a british nov british novelist cp snow illustrates chinese motives and methods his account of the construction of the tanzania zambia railroad in the 1970s i remember that i remember when the uh we watched a video in a, a movie in in my classroom uh in the 80s that talked about how china helped uh, Tanzania build railroads says it's the most striking a cooperative effort on a grain scale it succeeded in spite of ignorance and severe culture shock on both sides snow is firm in his belief that the crucial component in any long-term alliance of non-western peoples is not so much a matter of politics and economics as it is of formal human relations in his gently persuasive firm first book he demonstrates how the chinese and africans have bridged the gap of strangeness not without momentary setbacks through patient efforts to understand one another okay well the star raft anyway uh check it out but um yeah so veneration of the dead is uh something that i implore you to do You know, you can you can start real simple. You don't have to. It doesn't have to be uh, complicated. It, it doesn't it doesn't have to be complicated at all. It can be uh, a small space. It could it could be the top of your dresser. OK, if you have a dresser, um, you know, all you got to do. It's just make a small space somewhere in your uh, residence, right? A lot of people set them up in their closets. You know, you can set it up in your closet, a small little space in your closet, um, or even a small space in the corner of your room. Uh, but it's highly recommended that... Uh, you not go before your ancestors uh, naked. So, you know, you cover up your space that you have set up for them with, um, a, you know, a sheet or something, uh, a towel or, or something that, uh, you know, you can just put over your altar uh, while you uh, get dressed or, you know, walk around naked or whatever. Okay, but... Um, 
it, it needs to be a small space that's just dedicated to them. Um, and that space that's dedicated to them should be clean. You should have an area around the space that's clean. And uh, it doesn't have to have a picture of anyone. Okay, but having a picture, you know, having some pictures uh, can help you uh, with your concentration, your focus on your ancestors, uh, but it's not required. Uh, you should have uh, a glass of water. It doesn't even have to be a, gla a glass of water. It could be a bowl of water. Uh, it could be a cup of water, but, you know, a glass looks nice. It looks nice when it's in a glass. Uh, but you, you want to have that. Uh, you need to have a candle, a white candle. Um, you have a white candle there. So aside from, you know, if we want to really be truthful here, okay, there is no such thing as a white person who has skin that's the actual color white, okay? They, the racist white supremacists who invented white supremacy, stole the color white and applied it to themselves because of what the color white represents. The color white represents purity. The color white represents spirituality. It represents uh, clarity. It represents peace, right? The color white represents that. And they stole that color and applied it to themselves. So it's not the color white that you should be bothered with, which I think in a way they've actually convinced us that we should be, right? Based on the, uh, the deception and violence that, has, that we've received you know, from uh, people who have classified themselves as white, who have chose to mistreat us on the basis of our color of our skin color, those people, right, um, who, who mistreated us and they classify themselves as white, want us to have a dislike for the actual color white. And we shouldn't have that, right? The actual color white has a lot of positive positive um, benefits. That's why when I apply, when I refer to white people, I put white in quotes because they're not really white. You know, um, but anyway, um, a white candle, you got it. So you have a glass of water, a white candle and a vase with some flowers in it, if you can, right? You wanna make sure that you represent the elements. So you, you have fire, you have water, and the uh, flowers will represent the earth, okay? And then you have air, which is the air around you, right? But you have, make sure you have those elements on your altar. And if you can think of some names of some people who are uh, your ancestors who are dead that are directly connected to you in your bloodline, you go to the altar and you call them out. You call their names when you ask for uh, help, when you want them to, to uh, help you. You know, generally we start off with the word moyuba, which, which means uh, praise, you know, or I pay homage to. You know, so many of you all out there, you love to use the word ashe. Ashe, ashe, ashe. Um, this gives you an opportunity to use that word because that's how you close. You open with moyuba and you close with ashe. And ashe means like, make it happen, make it so. Right? Um, but I'm just telling you what to do to try it out, okay? And if you can, if you if you if you have a table or if you can make a space, 
you want to make sure that you use a white um, a white sheet or a white cloth it has it should be clean but you know that that goes on top and then you put the the water the candle and the uh, flowers on top of that okay and then you want to write out a list with your ancestors names on it you know the ones who are closest to you uh, would be the ones you call first so like um the, the one the the most recent ancestor the one who died the la the last person to pass away in your ancestral lineage would be the one who you call upon first and if there's anything that you possess that belonged to one of them you know you can take that uh item and put that on your altar as well so um yeah i'm pretty much done for today i hope that the information I gave you was constructive in helping you set up an altar. Uh, like I said before, many of you won't fall in until you see that the rest of the world is doing it or that white people are doing it. Um, it seems to be like the absolute most difficult thing. Actually, it's, it's just like the code. You know, every victim of white supremacy that that i know that that i associate with on a regular basis not everyone there's a few that have set up their altars um but the majority who's constantly i mean constantly filled with negative um what and what i mean is they're constantly finding ways to to uh, put down other individual victims, right? Like they select uh, other individual victims who they refer to as coons or, uh, you know, uh, more confused. And I mean, granted, I mean, we got huge numbers of victims who are confused, right? That these same individuals, I find also struggling. They're also struggling with their own personal situations right and if you're listening today i implore you set up your ancestral veneration tonight today don't be afraid like the racist white supremacists have taught us many of us to have a negative idea about prayer right because many of us think well prayer doesn't help prayer doesn't work it does work if you use it properly okay number one if you believe it doesn't work it ain't gonna work okay you definitely it definitely requires you to have some faith um and and we're not talking about praying to the sky in the sweet by and by and, and 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 believing that you won't get yours until you die this this is this is not the prayer we're talking about because it's all about your intentions okay prayer uh, can help you focus on getting the work done whatever it is that you need done and it doesn't just help you focus on getting work done but it brings opportunities to you that that are placed before you 
that, um, you know, all you have to do is step forward and, and take advantage of the opportunity, you know, it will help you trust me. Um, so anyway, that's it y'all. I'm done. I, I thank you uh, very much for, uh, tuning in to today's episode. I hope it was constructive. And uh, we'll get back with the, the regular music here as we uh, depart from the broadcast today. So thank you so much. Please like, share, and subscribe. If you've already subscribed, just share, uh, like, um, what else, what else, what else? Contribute to the Cash App if you can. I appreciate that. Um, what else? What else can you do? You can set up your damn ancestral altar. That's what you can do. Thank you so much. Oh, wait, wait. You know what? Before I go, because I see I got a few minutes left. I could just round it up to three hours. Are there any questions? Does anybody have any questions? Anybody watching that might have any questions about ancestral veneration uh, that you would like to ask? There's anything along those lines of questions about the ancestors. You type your question in the chat. I can answer it before I go. See, I'm going, I'm just going to flip through the comments to see if I missed anybody. So Christine said, yep, I did, Christine. I opened the door for them to communicate with me. I did. They, um... I can't, I can't really say I opened the door because they've been communicating with me um, as far back as I can remember, just as a little boy. It's just that um, I didn't recognize the communication for what it was. Um, and that's based on the misinformation that has been communicated to me through the racist white supremacist indirectly, you know, indirectly communicated to me and, uh, you know, also combined with, uh, the, the, uh, just the, the, the lack of knowledge, the lack of, of, of any knowledge about, uh, you know, the veneration of the ancestors.
If anybody's interested in what I'm about to eat, because I'm hungry. I'm about to eat bean soup. I made some a nice combination of beans and some chunks of chicken and chicken breasts and uh, okra in there along with some onions and some garlic and I decided to blend it all together so it's like a like a just a smooth soup you know, requires no chewing of the teeth I think something like that could be really light on the stomach make uh, make it uh, you know take a whole lot of uh, pressure off the stomach one of the things I learned from uh, the teachings of Elijah Muhammad which is uh, his his part of the teachings called how to eat to live uh, he says that one of the major causes of bad health is the fact that we're constantly putting food in our stomachs. Our stomachs are like working overtime to digest food, right? And so you said, you know, if you think of think of your stomach in terms of uh, giving it a rest, so it's not in constant digestion mode, uh, or that you know, if it is digesting, that what it's digesting is something that's really light and simple. Doesn't take a whole lot of um, energy for your stomach to digest. So, you know, taking that, keeping that in mind, I said, yeah, I think I'm going to make this into a bean soup, type of bean soup that I remember eating when I used to go to the, my, my uh, uh, attempted parents used to take me to the Muslim restaurants, Nation of Islam restaurants to eat. So uh, I'm telling you this as we wait for some questions. It doesn't look like I see one, not even one question. Oh, also, I want to uh, tell you all that some of my broadcasts here on YouTube have been, well, some of my broadcasts on YouTube have been blocked, so you can't see them. But because I simultaneously broadcast live on Twitter and Facebook, you can catch uh, any uh, of my live broadcasts that you missed. You can you can find them on my my Facebook page, which is uh, Doctor Sin Q Facebook page. Uh, you can find them on my Twitter page, which is the same thing, Doctor Sin Q. And uh, I, I haven't removed any of the videos from Twitter or Facebook, so you should be able to catch some past ones that you can't find on youtube if you just go on there on those uh those social media pages wanted to get that out and anything else i think that's it since nobody's going to ask any questions going to go ahead and uh, thank you for watching I'm going to go eat so I'm gone <laughs>